attend at this time. All right, recording started. Welcome everybody. Um, I'm Megan Marrero. I am the national coordinator of our All Atlantic Blue Schools Network um, and our USA Blue Schools. So I just wanted to take a second to tell you guys um, about the Blue Schools and about Nismia, who is our co-host for this um, event. So just really quick, um, Blue Schools, this was our this was our wonderful flyer for this event. So you can see at the bottom, USA Blue Schools. So we are part of a network that is up and down both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and it's all schools that are working to integrate ocean learning into the curriculum um, and trying to foster an ocean literate society. So that's a big job. Um, and teachers are and students are working to do that in different ways. And we hope you'll all become uh, more involved in this work as well. Um, so for teachers who might be new to this, um, we are looking for you to work on promoting ocean literacy through learning in multiple subject areas and or multiple grade levels and participate in action projects. Those action projects could be things like beach cleanups or um, native garden planting um, or creating PSAs or water testing, uh, involving your community in some way or other organizations and connecting with other schools within the network and creating a plan within your, um, within your school to improve ocean literacy. And we do have a few things coming up. Um, we have a student symposium that we're planning for May where some of you students might be able to share what you are working on, for instance. And then the last plug, I thought I, oh yeah. Um, so teachers, you can fill out a form to become a blue school on the usablueschools.com website. Um, so take a look at that and you'll see it's pretty simple. We're really um, inclusive. We want everyone to be involved in this network um, and learn from each other uh, as much as possible. The last little plug I'd like to make is for, I, we have a lot of New Yorkers here, uh, is for the NISMIA conference, which is on April 29th. Um, I will send you guys a link to register, but you can also use this QR code. It's going to be held at Mercy College in the Bronx, um, which is right over the Whitestone Bridge. If you're in Brooklyn or Queens, it's not that far. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to welcome our speaker for today, Noah Chesnin from the Wildlife Conservation Society and the New York Aquarium, who's going to talk about um, the new proposed National Marine Sanctuary right here in our New York waters. So Noah, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hi, everybody, and thank you, Dr. Marrero uh, and the Blue Schools Network, as well as Nismia, for the chance to be here this morning with everybody. Um, as Dr. Marrero said, my name is Noah Chesnin, and I work for the Wildlife Conservation Society. Uh, which runs the New York Aquarium and the zoos here in New York City. I'm going to share my screen in a moment uh, and, and get started with uh, the presentation. So let's see. You should be able to see, and let me put it in. The slides look good, everybody? Great. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm going to talk about Hudson Canyon and the work uh, that the New York Aquarium and other groups, including um, teachers and students, um, organizations across the Mid-Atlantic have been doing to support uh, a new national marine sanctuary. I'll, I'll give first an introduction to WCS and the, the conservation program, the New York Seascape program that I work for. Uh, then I'll talk about Hudson Canyon and what makes it special <clears throat> and why it should become a national marine sanctuary. And then we will have some time for Q&A and discussion. And I'm really excited to hear your questions and, and and then have a discussion. So to, to most folks, um, the Wildlife Conservation Society, if you've heard of us, uh, we are the Bronx Zoo, um, the New York Aquarium in Coney Island. Uh, we also run the Central Park, Queens, and Prospect Park zoos. So we see about 4 million visitors a year, uh, which is really exciting. Um, but we're also a global conservation organization. So we we're headquartered in New York City at the Bronx Zoo, uh, but we work uh, in 16 priority regions uh, where uh, both marine and terrestrial wildlife and human communities interact uh, and work to balance conservation and sustainable use. And so what you can see on this map are the places around the world where we have scientists and staff working with local communities. Highlighted in red is my program, 
uh, the New York Seascape Program here in the waters of New York and New Jersey. And so this, this here is a map uh, that we made with National Geographic uh, several years ago. We give it out for free uh, at the aquarium and would be happy to share and send uh, maps to any schools or teachers and students that want, want them. So feel free to follow up with uh, Dr. Marrero and myself, uh, and I can help get you some maps. Um, and what you can see from the map is that we have uh, an area between Cape May, New Jersey and Montauk, New York, um, uh, Long Island Sound, the harbor, uh, New York Harbor, as well as the coastal bays of Long Island and the Jersey Shore. Uh, and there's just a wide array of marine habitats um, from inshore waters to the deep sea canyon, uh, which I'll be talking about, Hudson Canyon. Uh, but it's also a place where you know, there's a, a wide variety of species. So this map shows the, the, the sort of migration routes of different individual animals, uh, different sharks and birds and, and, and marine mammals, for example, even turtles, uh, but also shows how, how people living in the area uh, are using the waters uh, of New York and New Jersey, whether that's for fishing and diving, uh, for birding, for uh, shipping, even new uses like offshore wind. And so the, my work and the program uh, that the, the New York Aquarium has is working to balance sustainable use and conservation uh, in, our, in our ocean backyard. When most people think of New York City, um, they probably think of Manhattan and the density uh, uh, of all the buildings, um, of Times Square, maybe they think of the port of New York and New Jersey, um, and, and which is the largest port in the country. Um, it's you know more than 20 million people live in the greater uh, New York seascape region, basically the coastal waters, uh, the coastal area around New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. So there's a lot of people here, and um, if if we if I were to ask you uh, or ask New Yorkers what, what sort of wildlife come to mind, most people would probably say pigeons or maybe rats or you know, some of the <clears throat> other animals that you can find in the city. But uh, what, what folks don't realize often is that there are an incredible array of marine wildlife, um, that the, the biodiversity in New York and New Jersey waters around New York City and Long Island and the Jersey Shore is relatively intact. Um, we did a project several years ago to sort of look back at historic records to document what species had been observed, recorded, dating back to the 1600s. Um, and we know people have been living in this region for thousands of years. Uh, you know that the whether it's the Lenape and the Canarsie in New York City or you know the, the other other indigenous groups and, and tribal tribal groups uh, and nations um, have been present in what is now um, this New York City for for thousands of years, and in part that's because there has always been a real abundance and diversity of of life, and that's still reflected in the ocean. So we have um, more than three hundred and thirty species of fishes, and that includes forty species of sharks, skates, and rays. We have five sea turtles that will migrate through New York and New Jersey waters, um, 15 plus uh, cetaceans. Those are the um, great whales, you know, like humpbacks, fin whales, North Atlantic right whales. We have deep sea corals, seabirds, and, and, and even some of the oldest invertebrates like the horseshoe crab that's uh, photographed here on the lower right. So just as a little bit of background, my team has scientists um, that are out studying a wide array of species, including some sh species of sharks, uh, uh, diadromous fishes, uh, including, as you can see on the upper left-hand corner, alewife uh, and river herring. Uh, but we're also studying marine mammals. Um, and you can see the humpback whale on the lower left-hand corner feeding on menhaden. Uh, we're trying to understand how different species use the diverse habitats in our region, understand what um, pressures they're facing uh, from human activities, and find ways to use science to inform you know, conservation decisions. We're using really cool technologies. Uh, we have uh, the one on the lower in the center, uh, that yellow and blue buoy 
Uh, we have a partnership with Woods Hole where we're listening for whales. We have a passive acoustic buoys like this one out, out in the New York bight in the, in the waters off of New York and New Jersey, listening for whale vocalizations. And that data is, is shared in near real time on our website. So you can see today that there were some whales detected earlier this morning. And I can share out that website uh, later in the program. But I'm here to talk about Hudson Canyon. Um, circled in red on that map is the largest deep sea canyon along the East Coast. Um, and it was formed uh, about 10,000 years ago during the last ice age. It's about 100 miles south and east of the Statue of Liberty and then spans another 350 miles uh, further offshore. So it's this enormous, really large geologic feature. Uh, it's on the scale of the Grand Canyon. So if you were to go to its deepest point, um, and then you would need seven and a half Empire State Buildings stacked on top of each other to go from the sea floor to the surface of the ocean. So it's this enormous geologic feature. Uh, it is important uh, ecologically. Uh, so currents, there's upwelling that draws water from the seafloor to the surface, and that really drives primary productivity uh, so that you see uh, a lot of plankton blooms and, and, and sort of the base of the food web uh, is really abundant. And, and so that draw, draws hundreds of species, um, whether that's deep sea corals, marine mammals, uh, a wide array, array of fishes, uh, turtles, seabirds. You know, there's just a diversity of life that either is, is resident in Hudson Canyon or migrates through. Um, and because of that, it's also really an important place economically. Um, the, the canyon supports a wide array of commercial and recreational fisheries. Um, it's also, you know, we're relying on it right now, actually. Um, there are deep sea cables that go around the canyon, telecommunication cables that connect me and other New Yorkers and New Jersey residents to the internet. So the, our ability to, to have this presentation online right now is, is a result of deep sea cables going around the canyon. Back in 2016, um, you know, because we, we know how important it is both ecologically and economically, um, the, the New York Aquarium put together a nomination and proposed that Hudson Canyon should become a national marine sanctuary. The, the sanctuary system, the sanctuary program is a federal program through the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, through NOAA, the agency, not, not through myself. Um, and it's a federal program with 15 sites around the country currently, 15 sites in the ocean and Great Lakes, that are special places in our, in our waters, uh, both ecologically, economically, and or culturally. Uh, so it's meant to protect those places and support multiple uses that balance conservation and sustainable use. So this is the map. I, I, I gather there's a group from Santa Barbara. Uh, so you can see some of the sanctuaries off your coast. Uh, and in fact, there's a proposed sanctuary designation moving forward, the Shumash Heritage. Sanction, uh, sanctuary off of California. I'll be talking about the Hudson Canyon National Marine Sanctuary designation because it's off of New York where, we're, where I'm based, um, but there are other sites around the country as well. Um, we, we proposed Hudson Canyon as a National Marine Sanctuary really to secure sort of permanent conservation outcomes as well. And, and one key outcome we're seeking is to permanently close the area around the canyon to oil, gas, and mineral exploration and extraction. Both the exploration and the extraction could have really uh, significant impacts on marine wildlife, as well as on uh, local fisheries. And so the map on the left shows uh, the sites that were where test drilling occurred in the late 70s and early 80s and documented methane uh, deposits uh, to the south and west of the canyon. And then the map on the right, which is the eastern uh, seaboard flipped on its side, 
has red, green, and yellow dots where there are documented methane seeps. Uh, and there are 50 five zero seeps that have been documented um, in Hudson Canyon. And what that shows is that there's a, a, a methane resource um, that could be extracted. Um, those seeps are actually really important. They provide uh, habitat for chemosynthetic communities, uh, invertebrates and other marine wildlife that rely on um, methane as their primary source of energy as opposed to sunlight. Um, so there's really sensitive communities around these seeps and it sort of would be impacted, for example, by uh, if, if drilling were to take place. We also know that there's uh, a lot of uh, both recreational and commercial fishing in and around the canyon and, and you know, whether that's for squid or tilefish or red crab. Um, so the, the aquarium and other partners, you know, fishing industry groups, conservation groups, community groups have worked to really support uh, well-managed fisheries um, in, in the canyon. Uh, there's protections for deep sea corals. Uh, there's protections for some of the forage fish, you know, the base of the food web, you know, small fish and invertebrates that serve as prey for other predator species. And so as a part of our recommendations, uh, we have said that fishing should continue under the existing authorities. Um, but that's still, you know, there's important benefits for research and monitoring, we think, uh, that can help inform fisheries management, that can help inform, uh, you know, the, the shipping and, and other activities across uh, the canyon. And so there's, there's a lot that can happen um, to... Uh, invest in STEM research and education that will really be uh, a benefit, uh, not only to the wildlife, but the people uh, around the region. And, and, and we see, you know, a program that the sanctuary uh, system is engaged in called the Sentinel Site Cooperative Program, um, which takes key areas around uh, the U.S. And, and invests further research and monitoring especially to understand how climate change will impact these special places. Um, and that there are a wide array of uh, science, technology, engineering, and math STEM roles uh, and that will help ensure that we're studying and, and understanding marine science and conservation issues uh, in, if a sanctuary were designated. So we see a lot of opportunities for careers in, in ocean science. Um, and these are just a smattering of some of the types of jobs and, and roles um, that we, we think might be of interest for, for young students like yourselves. Um, so as I said, we proposed Hudson Canyon as a national marine sanctuary in 2016. Um, we, we moved through the process a little bit uh, during the last administration, but uh, we were really excited last summer uh, in June, the, the Biden-Harris administration uh, announced on World Oceans Day on June 8th, 2022, uh, that they were starting the process, the designation process uh, for Hudson Canyon as a national marine sanctuary. And, and this is being led now by, by NOAA, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the federal government has articulated these goals uh, for, for the designation process. You know, that they, they see that the sanctuary could help support the long-term conservation of marine wildlife and habitats and cultural resources in Hudson Canyon, that the designation uh, can work to identify and raise awareness of the indigenous connections, you know, to whether it's the Shinnecock Nation or other federally and state recognized tribes. Um, to the, to the canyon, highlight and promote sustainable uses, uh, as I said, like uh, well-managed and sustainably managed fisheries um, or recreational uses, things like that. Expand ocean science and monitoring, educational programming, you know, connecting with the Blue Schools Network uh, and the National Marine Educators Association and the, and the New York State Marine Educators Association to, to promote student engagement. Um, and then provide a platform for diverse partnerships and collaboration. So working with uh, industry groups or conservation groups with uh, cultural organizations to, to help 
connect and bring the canyon to the shore. So we're really excited that the designation process has started. It's a multi-year process that allows for many opportunities for public and, and you know public participation. So I just want to walk through some of the ways that we've been engaging um, not only stakeholders but also youth and and schools and students to participate because everybody has a stake uh, in what happens in the ocean. Um, you know the federal government owns and manages the ocean for the public's good for the public trust. Um, and so you know we as citizens, we as uh, you know residents uh, have a chance to help shape what the government does uh, in, in, both, uh, as it sets up the sanctuary and then as the sanctuary is managed. Um, so the aquarium and other partners worked collaboratively to build support from a really broad array of, of industry and, and science and, and conservation and, and community organizations. So, you know, rec and commercial fishing groups have, have offered conditional support. So, um, you know, aquariums and zoos, lots of scientists, even arts organizations, you know, Carnegie Hall and the Metropolitan Museum of Art want to help tell the story through arts and culture. Uh, and there are a variety of artists uh, that have expressed support uh, for the sanctuary designation. Teachers uh, and other informal educators have also stepped up, but also to have uh, whale watch operations and birding organizations. Uh, even tourism groups see the be benefit that, you know, this can draw people to New York City to learn about the ocean and, and go whale watching, for example. And then uh, faith leaders from many different faiths uh, across the region have offered their support. But I really wanted to highlight the important role that youth have played. Um, so uh, youth leaders from the aquarium and, and other conservation groups and like, the, like RISE, uh, which is a, a group in the Rockaways in, in New York City, have, have been doing outreach to um, other youth groups around the city, to schools, um, to community organizations to build support. Uh, and so on the right, you'll see uh, the photo of the students that testified at the public hearings um, in New York City in July of last summer. Uh, and then on the left, just an example of one student project, uh, one of the youth ocean advocates at the aquarium, Bryn Heller, She's a high school. She's a high school senior now, but she started as a as a sophomore, and, and put together a video PSA um, about Hudson Canyon and why she thinks it's important um, to educate and raise awareness with her fellow high school students. And then she had a petition that she circulated during last summer. Um, and this is just a screenshot when she had two hundred and fifty signatures. Uh, they're currently about 800, 850, 900, I think. So she continues to raise awareness. Um, but, you know, we also had, you know, families and kids uh, at the aquariums um, and the zoos, you know, signing letters, petitions, doing drawings, uh, even dancing the can-can for the canyon. So there's, you know, fun ways, creative ways to show you care about the ocean to, to sort of communicate public uh, support. Um, it doesn't always just have to be sitting at a, uh, testifying at a meeting. It could also, you know, be a, a music video or, or posting on social media and things like that and, and relaying that message to elected officials. So, you know, right now we are gearing up uh, for more public participation later this year. And so that, you know, there's always a chance to participate and, and whether it's studying marine science and, and learning about the wildlife in Hudson Canyon, you know, increasing ocean literacy and then taking action, you know, in your ocean backyard or with your community to support ocean health. Um, that's really, really important. So I'm sure you must have questions. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen and then we can we can have a conversation. So thank you. Thank you so much, Noah. It's interesting to learn about the process and also the importance of the area. Um, so, so far we have a couple of questions in the chat. So maybe you want to address those first and then if other groups want to either unmute and ask questions or put more questions in the chat, we can go from there. 
Great. Yeah, let me pull up the chat. Um, you know, Chris. So I think there was a question of what does an ichthyologist do? Yeah, that's a good question. And I don't know if I see Lisa's here too. I don't know if you know. So ichthyologists study fish. Um, it's a, the scientific name, uh, basically. And so this is um, an important role to play, right? To understand uh, the life history, the, the you know, the, the, the migration patterns, the, the sort of uh, prey and predation uh, patterns for, for, for fish species and understanding how they fit within the local ecosystem. Um, so that, that's, um, that's a one, one, one type of role, um, but there are many. So you could also, um, you know, if you like maps, for example, you know, there's an important role to play in helping visualize scientific data uh, with what's called ge geospatial information systems, GIS, um, and mapping basically how different species and human activities overlap um, in Hudson Canyon or in other ocean areas. Um, if you like uh, uh, graphic design, um, like we have staff at the aquarium and the zoos and there are other, other organizations that, that have graphic designers that design exhibits or you know, that, that are ma making books or you know, other publications. So there's ways all different types of, of roles that, that weave together STEM and ocean science and ocean literacy. Let's see, did I miss other questions? So the other well, big question I'm seeing a couple of times is how can students get involved and, and participate in this process? That's, that's a great question. So um, one, one way to participate is, you know, so the, my organization, the Wildlife Conservation Society has uh, a website where we describe more information about, about the um, Hudson Canyon and, and the work that's happening. And so things are updated pretty regularly there, at, you know, when there are comment periods or petitions, and you're always uh, welcome to not only learn more about Hudson Canyon, but also, um, you know, sign, sign a petition. Uh, if, you're, if you're excited to do more, you know, there's ways, for example, you could um, organize uh, with your school, like do a beach cleanup and have a presentation with um, to, to fellow students and community members about how the connection between the shore and, and basically, you know, like cleaning up trash is important because it will, you know, reduce the amount of, uh, especially plastic trash in the ocean. Um, and that, that will connect you know, like a day of service to, you know, the, the canyon as well. Um, so, so there's a lot of different ways. Um, NOAA, the, the, the federal government also has a website about Hudson Canyon now too. Um, so there's, you know, a chance to, to sort of learn more and, and see what, what, they're, what they're doing as well. Another question I'm seeing is about the formation of the canyon and its yeah. connection to Hudson River as well. That's a good question. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, so I, I think I mentioned that the canyon was formed about 10,000 years ago during the last ice age. So at that point, um, sea level was much lower um, and there was uh, basically an ice dam that broke that, that helped where, where the Hudson River carved out, whether it's the Palisades, you know, north of, of the city in Westchester, or, you know, basically carved out uh, the river. And you can see on the map that there's the sort of submerged riverbed extends underwater uh, to uh, across the sandy shelf uh, off of off, off New York and New Jersey, and then carved out the canyons. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the Hudson River and the Hudson Canyon are connected. That's uh, a really astute observation. Um, and, you know, the, the, the sort of importance that we place on the Hudson River is well-founded, but we should also place that same importance and, and think about our connection to, to the canyon. And so the sanctuary work hopefully will help make that bridge the river and the harbor uh, with, with 
the deep sea canyon as well. Was there, let's see, is Gateway National Recreation Area and, and Fire Island National Seashore and Sandy Hook involved with the process of Hudson Canyon becoming a national marine sanctuary? Um, the answer is, is yes. Um, so that while, while the process is being led by, uh, by NOAA, um, they are partnering and collaborating with other federal agencies. Um, and so, you know, the, the National Seashore, the National Park System, but also, um, you know, the, the Department of the Interior more broadly, um, there's a way that the, basically the federal government is coordinating with other federal agencies, as well as with, um, as well as with the state of New York and New Jersey, Connecticut, even uh, tribal governments. Um, they're forming a, an advisory council uh, with uh, you know, representatives from different industry and conservation and scientific perspectives. And, and the, the, the other government agencies will also have a seat at that table as well. Thank you. Any other students have questions? Oh, here we go. Here's one from Will. What, uh, what are some common barriers and opportunities that arise from engagement on this diverse environment, on, on, on diverse environmental issues? Um, yeah, so the, that's a really important question. So, you know, we, the, the aquarium was drawn to the sanctuary nomination and designation process because um, it, it is intended to bring diverse communities, diverse stakeholders, uh, elected officials uh, all together to sort of work collaboratively. Um, and, and I would, you know, would be remiss to say that it's not all kumbaya, right? Like there are people who, um, while, um, while they're deeply vested in ocean issues, they, they might be opposed to um, this proposal, to the designation. Um, what I'm excited to say is that, you know, sometimes that's because they weren't aware of like what the sanctuary designation process looks like or what, what sanctuaries usually look like when they're, when they're established. Um, so for example, we know that some of the commercial fishing industry had been really worried that both the aquarium or other partners were trying to close Hudson Canyon to commercial fishing as a part of the designation. And while that has not been a part of what we have advocated for, um, you know, they, there was no, what we propose is not necessarily what the federal government will do at, in the end. Um, that said, you know, we've been able to build that broad coalition um, that I referenced all those different letters We've also been able to build bipartisan support uh, in, in Congress. You know, so we have both Democrats and Republican members of Congress articulating this sort of consensus view that there's you know, a way to balance conservation and sustainable use and allow fishing under the existing authorities. So we hope that that will help, help provide more certainty. Um, but that's, you know, it is, you know, like I said, there, there are folks who are opposed. Um, I was pleased to see that some of them hopefully are going to participate in that sanctuary advisory council. So you keep that conversation going and, and build consensus. Um, but that's that's a really important, you know, important point. Like this isn't easy. It takes work. You have to listen. You have to um, come to the conversation with the opportunity to find common ground. And that's that's how we've tried to approach things. Um, let's see. Do you have any information on the process to become a blue school? I answered that one. <laughs> oh, you did. Great. Uh, and then I see Lisa, you have a question. Oh, yeah, uh, actually, I just wanted to say that representing the New York State Marine Education Association, uh, we very much support this initiative and um, we'll be looking for ways to uh, promote it. And um, especially with the uh, with a PSA and getting signatures, I think those are those are, are must haves, and we could certainly um, try and do that at our local events in Brooklyn. Thank you, Lisa. We we appreciate your support. 
and welcome the chance to work more with you. So Noah, what is the next step in this process? Like you kind of yeah. explained where we are, but now what? Now what? So so the the, the next step is that the um, NOAA is establishing a sanctuary advisory council that has those different stakeholder and government representatives. Um, and the, the goal then will be to have, you know, public input and um, stakeholder and government input to help describe what the boundaries could be, right? So right now there is a general area that has been articulated, but no specific boundaries. So the federal government will come up with several different, what are called alternatives, several proposals for what the boundaries could be, and then we'll ask for public input. So that that will provide a chance for, for students and teachers and families and communities to provide input. They will, the other sort of, in a sense, the document that the, the federal government is going to prepare is a uh, like a draft management plan. So this gets sort of technical, um, but the idea is like, what is going to be allowed? What's not allowed? What are the, like the priorities for educational programming? What are the, you know, the research and monitoring priorities? Um, and so this is a chance, that's really where the meat of like, what is it that we want? Uh, what do we want to see happen when a sanctuary is established? Um, what, what are the ways that we want the sanctuary program to connect with local communities. And, 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 and so that, that's where public comment will be really important to show like they're on the right track or no, they need to think about other issues um, as well. Um, and so, you know, the, the intention is that the sanctuary designation process is meant to be interactive. Uh, and then once once the designation happens, and we're hoping that's in a year or two, right? This is a slow process. Uh, you know, we submitted in 2016. We're hoping to have a designation in the next couple of years. So maybe, uh, you know, it's. A, I hope to still have some hair by the time it's all done. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, the the real exciting part is that you know, this is meant to include public participation once it's designated. You know, like we all have a stake, as I said, in, in like how the ocean uh, is managed and what sort of conservation efforts happen and how sustainable use is supported. And so, you know, even after the designation, there will be opportunities for students and teachers and the community to participate. Um, and that's that's really important. We want that sort of civic action to be a part of you know, translating ocean literacy for action uh, as well. So. Do other participants have questions? I can ask another question, but. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess, can you talk a little bit about, so obviously you showed us this whole network of national marine sanctuaries. Mm -hmm. um, when you say like people will be able to participate in their sanctuary and that kind of thing, like what does that look like once the yeah. sanctuary is designated? Yeah, so there's a lot of really cool ways to participate. One, you know, like for for STEM programming in schools, for example, um, the the sanctuary program has worked collaboratively with local schools, and I expect they will do this. I hope they'll do this with with Nismia and the Blue School Network. Um, to develop curriculum about Hudson Canyons um, and educational resources. So that could be like drawing on uh, video and photographic, you know, images uh, from deep sea research cruises. You know, when, when NOAA goes out and does exploration in the canyon, there would be, you know, you know they would simulcast that exploration with uh, classrooms and hopefully the aquarium and other places to sort of show people in near real time, like what does the canyon look like in this particular location? And, you know, as they're exploring and looking for new species or studying the deep sea vent, the methane vents um, that I mentioned, you know, that's a way to sort of see in, in real time what, the, what this habitat looks like. Um, there would also be potentially you know, other types of partnerships, you know, for research and monitoring and hopefully um, career workforce development. Um, you know, we, we see, as I said, like really 
important roles uh, for ocean science monitoring, um, not only for the canyon and for a future sanctuary, but also for, you know, to support sustainable use around, around the New York and New Jersey ocean waters. And so, you know, we're hoping that there can be partnerships with schools and academic institutions of higher learning for like career, career workforce development. Um, and then there could be like fun ways to actually go out to Hudson Canyon. So in other, in, in other sanctuaries, you know, they have catch and release, um, you know, uh, fish programs, they have citizen science programs, they have uh, bird birding or whale watching programs, you know, so there's, you know, other ways to go out and experience uh, the canyon in in person, not just on your screen um, or in the classroom. So, you know, I think there's just a, a wealth of ideas, and and I would also encourage the teachers and students here today to think like, what would be fun ways for you? Because, you know, we are at the beginning of the process to set up the sanctuary, and so we can really help inform what the sanctuary program does as a way to to make those connections. Um, so. I'd, I'd, I'd encourage everybody here to think, you know, creatively and 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 share those ideas uh, with with Noah as well. Thank you. That's exciting. Um, it looks like we have a question from Kimberly White's class. You guys want to unmute and ask your question? Sure. Hi. Hi. Hello. Um, the question is: As a youth of this generation. How can we help in saving the ocean from population? And how can we have a peaceful protest on this matter? Thank you for that question. Yeah, so I think it sounds like you guys have some ideas already. Um, first of all, like learning about ocean science and learning about what's happening in your community is, is the first really important way to help support ocean conservation and, 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 and take, a, take a stance. Um, so, so I, I applaud you guys for, for being, you know, active members of your community and learning about these things, uh, today. And I'm sure in many days, uh, around as well. Um, and, and then I think, you know, the one important thing to do would be to, you know, talk to your family, talk to your friends, you know, build, build support, uh, you know, identify where you guys agree on something and, and, and then maybe you, you could write, uh, uh, a letter to the newspaper or post a blog uh, on, on your school's website describing what why ocean conservation is important to you. Um, you could write a letter to your elected officials. You know, in this case, you could write a letter to um, to your member of Congress or to your uh, to 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 the agency staff at NOAA. You know, so there are ways to sort of. You know, to be civically engaged, but you could also, you know, organize a cleanup. You could do a citizen science project, um, and, and sort of tell stories, you know, on social media about that, so that you know, sort of helping to build public awareness and showing how individual and collective action can support conservation. That's great. Um, looks like you have a question about the bio. Can you talk about the biodiversity? Um, is this not a rich resource and greatly desired for marine ecosystem resiliency? Yes. So the the um, the array of species, the biodiversity in New York and New Jersey waters is is not only is it relatively intact, um, uh, but it's very biodiverse. There, there's a wide array of species, um, and partly that's because you have species migrating in and out at different times of the year. So during the summer, uh, you'll, you'll see species uh, that from, from warmer climates, um, from, from the subtropics or, or, or you know, further south of New York and New Jersey. And then um, in the wintertime, you'll even see species migrating from the north southward towards our waters. Um, and what's important is that uh, this is really uh, important that the, the species diversity is intact, but the abundance, the sort of size of the different populations is much lower than historic baselines than historically it has been. Um, and I think that's a real opportunity. There's a real sense of hope um, 
that you know we can work collaboratively uh, as different communities, as citizens, as you know organizations and businesses to support sustainable use and conservation and help restore populations and protect habitats, uh, while also you know supporting sustainable fisheries and other other sustainable uses. So there's a way to build ecosystem resilience and and then also economic resilience uh, together. Uh, and that's, you know, that's founded on sort of supporting, you know, conserving biodiversity. I think there were some more questions that came in. Um, so what can schools do to get funding for trips to build support towards these issues? That's a really good question. So um, there, there is funding from, from NOAA, um, the, the sanctuary program and NOAA have you know, a grant application for schools that are affiliated with sanctuaries or sanctuaries that are being designated. So you, there is a small grant opportunity there. Um, uh, I think, I don't know, maybe Lisa or, 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 or Megan, if you wanted to share some of the opportunities through, through NISMIA, perhaps. Um, yeah. Um, well, um, it, I think that there could be an opportunity to support um, uh, classes, schools, classes, or students um, working on projects. You know, for example, if they need to get someplace to work on a resiliency project or a conservation project, um, uh, that seems um, like something this our organization would want to support. And I put into the chat also that our Earth Day is coming up. And for the student viewers here in this webinar, you might uh, want to be thinking about um, what kind of projects, conservation projects you could get involved in or um, organizations that you can uh, talk with um, about working on projects um, to kind of uh, align yourselves with um, why conserve the Hudson Canyon, translate working in a conservation project into um, an awareness of why it's important to save giant swaths of the planet. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there are definitely some funding opportunities out there for, for schools. Like you would have to work together um, with your with your teachers, um, students, but for instance, there's the thank you the Ocean Guardian program. So far, they don't have any in New York, but that yeah. uh, maybe so you can apply to be a guardian, right? So exactly. Um, but there's also the um, Climate Stewards program, um, and so that is around climate change, but also ocean uh, ocean science, and you can apply to do some action projects. Um, so it's not just to take you somewhere, but to do as as Lisa was saying to do a project related to ocean conservation um, and to get some funding to help you to, to enact that project. So if those are things that you're interested in, certainly talk with your teachers and, and they can talk with me and we can um, start looking at some possibilities. Yeah. All right, we may have time for one more question if anyone else wants to jump in. All right. Well, I think Noah has answered all of their questions. <laughs> well, if you have if you have future questions, you know, um, you know, feel free to to reach out. Um, we are, you know, the the what's so exciting about this work is that people can get engaged, and and we we don't know all the creative ideas that can come from that. So we we encourage, you know, to you know your participation and and would love to work collaboratively. So thank you for this opportunity today, and and thank you for all the work you guys do on ocean literacy and ocean health. And thank you so much for sharing all this great information. I think um, definitely some students are interested in getting involved. I know some of these students will be at the uh, It's My Estuary Day. So hopefully you get to see yeah. some of them yes. there, which yeah. will be awesome. Yeah, the beach cleanup they're talking about is uh, It's My Estuary Day. Um, so thank you, thank you for all that attended. We will be sending out the recording. I know some of your class periods didn't align that well, so we'll send that out to you. Um, and yeah, thanks for coming. I appreciate all of your attention and really smart questions. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you, thank you.